Hello, I'm Mike Shea. Uh, I am the host of the DM's Deep Dive, and we are here today with uh, Stefan Pokorny to talk about Dwarven Forge. Stefan, would you would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Stefan Pokorny. Oh, come on, a little bit more. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I uh, I own Dwarven Forge. Yeah. And we make terrain for Dungeons and Dragons. Just Three-dimensional terrain. terrain. Not the best terrain? The best! It's the best terrain, terrain out there. <laughs> there. And how long, how long have you been doing it? 21 years. 21 years. And you used to make it out of cardboard, if I understand. Well, I mean, before I had you know, the company, just me and my friends, I used to do the cardboard and maybe a little styrofoam or a shoebox, whatever you could get <laughs> hold of, you know. <laughs> yep, um, yep. Early yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to I wanted to bring you onto the show and talk to you because uh, I've been using Dwarven Forge for I think about ten years now. Uh, my my You're wonderful. Uh, is that a veteran? Is that veteran status? I don't know That's how long. Pretty good. A decade is pretty good. A decade, yeah. And I've 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 gone through many many different sets. My my beautiful wonderful and beautiful wife Michelle bought me the uh, Inn and Tavern set, which was our the, the first set that I had, and uh, that meant we had bar fights every week, right? Because you're oh. not going to have an Inn and Tavern set without a bar fight. Um, <laughs> yeah. And well, I've, I've yeah. since gone through them all. I've I've backed all the Kickstarters. I've 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 I have a lot. So I don't think compared to some that I've seen online, perhaps my my collection is just a drop in the bucket. Uh, You've got some big collectors. There's, out there. there's some big collectors out there. Yeah. And um, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight uh, was how we can make the most uh, out of Dwarven Forge. How can Dwarven Forge? Um, you know, make our games as good as they as good as they can be. Um, and on our on our show, I usually like to start off with uh, the top three tips. So, uh, what would you say are your top three tips for getting the most out of Dwarven Forge for our Dungeons and Dragons games? All right. Uh, first of all, take it out of the box. No, I said, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. And there are people that actually don't take it ever out of the box. They just collect it. Really. But, uh, use it, yes. But the top tip for creating, I would say, first uh, try to think what it is you want to make first. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, if you can visualize that, you know, I, I think our terrain is best at this point in time, really just to first you imagine what you want, then you take the pieces out, depending what you have, because everyone has a different amount. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the best thing to do is to lay all the pieces out and fiddle around with them and then build something you like. Mm -hmm. And and once you build something you like, then maybe revolve a story around that mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than try to copy, you know, uh, a module. Mm. Although now in our last uh, in our last Kickstarter, we did have all these specialized and small little pieces that actually will help you build like a module, you know, more easily because you can build so many different, more shapes now. Mm -hmm. so actually, mm -hmm. I'm just going to reverse course there and say, you know, you do <laughs> right, right, right. Is that, is that one tip or is that all three packed together? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> how many tips are, I, I don't know. I, I, I can only remember one thing at a time. <laughs> I, you know, I'm very bad with the, uh, the remembering. That's actually that, that's very interesting. The idea I would and and that's something I wanted to dig into a little more. Um, the like you know how to how to get the most out of it. The the idea of kind of throwing all the pieces on the table, building something, yeah. and then building an adventure around whatever you happen to build. I think is an yeah. interesting an interesting well, approach. I, I mean, what I mean is like kind of like have a vague idea of what you want. Like okay, I I want something to happen in the town guard place. You know. So then take your pieces and try to build something that to you looks like the town guard. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. oh, this is going to be in a warehouse down by the docks. And then take the pieces you have and then build what you, you think is a warehouse. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just like, even if you're going to copy like a module, does it really matter if it doesn't look exactly the same? I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that much. What matters is the story 
And so you'd be like, well, whether it's a 40 by 60 foot room or 30 by 40 foot room, I, I don't think it really matters. Mm -hmm. There's probably a bunch of tactical war gamers out there that are that are, you know, screening, at, screening out at the screen scene right now. Like, it has to be exactly 40 feet across. You are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, so that so so when you're building out your layouts, uh, is that is that how you go about it? Do you kind of like do you do you oh you, you know you you, you yeah. mentioned having like a vague idea in your head and then throwing a bunch of pieces and then it starts to solidify. How how much planning do you do before you start building a, a setup? I actually don't do any planning at all. I, yeah. I just but you know I I'm fortunate enough to have a yeah, lot all, of pieces. all of it right. You have all <laughs> of the dwarven all board. the pieces. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually. There are people out there that have more than me because I actually <laughs> do not even have every piece that we've made. There's just really? not enough room, you know. Wow. Uh, but I do have the basic pieces you need and lots of them. So what I would usually do is I have a very vague idea. Okay, they're going to go into a tunnel somewhere, right? And then I'm a very hack and slash Mm -hmm. kind of guy i'm not really very there's a cerebral story with this villain and he's that and no it's really just about there's monsters kill them take the treasure that that's i do this for fun you know i don't want to rack my brain over you know so <laughs> I, I usually have just a vague idea and what i do is i lay out the pieces almost as though i was walking through that maze myself mm -hmm. you know like i'll start with stairs down then i'll start with a corridor and i'll be like ah. Then I just have fun. I say, well, what should happen here? Why don't I put like a round room here? And then maybe I'll have a bunch of, you know, entrances. And let, let me try this piece over here. And I'll start grabbing pieces I like and put them there. And then from that, as I go along, I sort of make up some kind of vague story as I'm playing with the pieces. You know, mm -hmm. like a little mm -hmm. kid would do. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's sure. kind of what you do. Yeah. Sure, sure. Is that is that how you? I mean, do you 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 almost always typically do it that way do you have any other approaches that you've that you've tried that was kind of like well this is a this is a different way for me to build something out well sometimes i might have a particular inspiration you know like i might like one time i was imagining oh wouldn't it be great if all the adventurers just woke up in a dark cave and they didn't know how they got there and they had their arms and legs cut off <laughs> oh no eyes were gouged out and uh, their tongues were cut off, so they couldn't speak or do anything. And, and what if they were in the middle of a lake? And so I had that vague idea, and then so that I started building it. <laughs> is that is just basically four four corners put together into a small room? They, they're in the middle. They're not, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> cavern, a cavernous lake on an island in a a jail, and uh, the giants were coming and taking them one by one and eating them. Oh man. And, they, they, Zaltar, the evil uh, uh, necromancer, had sent them there, and they didn't remember what happened. But they were gradually, they were remembering what was happening. So I was passing them little notes saying, "You remember this, and you remember that." Hmm. And the more they remembered, the the more uh, scared they got, you know. And mm -hmm. and then they couldn't talk to each other, but they started to write in the sand, you know, messages <laughs> to each other. And then eventually they. I don't want to give it away, but they did manage to escape the island. And then they were in the cave. Then they ended up having to navigate a whole other dungeon to get out of there. So the whole story was, how do we get out of here? And they, they managed to get out, some of them. So it was the whole, a success. The whole, dungeon, the whole dungeon that you built for that was all glorious Dwarven Forge? Yes, all Dwarven Forge, a lot of it. And there was a lot of traps and monsters. And they, they were, imagine, they finally got away. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was like one of the ideas, you know. Another one could be like a sewer. Imagine, oh, something funny is happening. You go down into sewer, and then I would like build out a sewer, and then imagine what kind of monsters would be in the sewer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, uh, so I, I I talked to some folks before I I uh, um um before I had talked to you about this, or and well not before I guess like after I knew you were coming on the show, I kind of you know, ask folks about what, what we should talk about. And a lot of people all came down to, if somebody has a limited budget, uh, what, what should they get? Like, what's the, what's the minimum successful Dwarven Forge set? Well, I mean, once again, it depends. What is it you want to make? Mm -hmm. Like if you want to make, uh, 
houses, villages, a town, then you want to buy, you know, city builder pieces. If you want to buy castles, then you buy castles. If you want to, you know, build a dungeon, you buy dungeon pieces. If you mm -hmm. want a, a cavern, you, you buy cavern pieces. So there's many different areas that you could go into. Mm -hmm. But I find the most bread and butter, the thing most dungeon uh, dungeon masters want to make are dungeons. Mm -hmm. So I would say like, you know, room and passage set, room mm -hmm. set, the, the pieces that are just corners, walls, and floors. All right. Right. Basically, everything starts with that. Corners, walls, and floors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I do believe we have those available. I know we ran out at some one point, but we got restocked, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, we should never run out of that, because that is... Because <laughs> everyone true. wants it. Yeah. How can you be a dungeon seller if you don't have dungeons, right? Right, right, so we right. we got to have those. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've definitely found that to be true. The first, the first Kickstarter, you know, focused on the corners, floors, and, and walls, and... and, yes. and it's amazing all of the things you can build with just those three pieces. You know, you can build cells and you can yeah. build hallways and you can, you know, I've, I've been, yeah, it's fun I'm to just so sit there. Basic. The Kickstarter one, it was like so basic. And yeah. yeah. Look back, I think, wow, that was so simple compared to Dungeon of Doom. <laughs> yeah, right. No kidding. Oh and and not, not having the Dungeon of Doom in hand yet, I, I still, and, and I, I have them all, but I still, the, the go-to set that I that I tend to pull out more than any other one is the is the, the you know those are that original set from that first Kickstarter. You're gonna need it when 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 you get the Dungeon of Doom because yep. you're gonna love those basic pieces. Yeah, right. Because, uh, that's really the bread and butter. You want to build rooms. Yep. And all the other fancy pieces are cool, but you're gonna find yourself falling back constantly on the corners, the walls, the mm -hmm. floors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. So, so uh, taking the corner of the wall and the floor and setting them aside for a moment, uh, what would you say are your three favorite and and most useful Dwarven Forge pieces, like specific pieces that that you that you love and that you find yourself always going to? That's a very tough question. Uh, all right, I like the traps. Yeah. You no, know, I'm just an evil man. <laughs> I love to, you know, make a dungeon and then throw in traps. And yeah. uh, I, I usually, I shouldn't be telling you this. You know, I'm giving a, away a lot of, you know, my secrets, right? Well, that, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Squeeze you. Squeeze like the secrets the, out. Uh, the, swinging, the swinging trap that comes mm -hmm. around the corridor and uh, decapitates you. <laughs> uh, the five-ton block that falls from the ceiling. Right. So I like to just, we have a little block with a chain on it. Right. So I just come from behind the screen, dangling the, uh, <laughs> the thing going, oh no, you stepped on that flagstone and you hear a snapping sound from above. And I'll come out with my, with my thing and I'll, I'll let go of the string and the crush chain. Their, and crush their little miniature. Crush their little miniature. <laughs> <laughs> the looks on their faces is always priceless. Right. So, I'm very evil that way. I, I like to. I, I like to see it when they. You like the torment. They panic and they're like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> no. No. I, just, I just get glared at. I get glared at, and then they, <laughs> and they get, and then they take out their phones. <laughs> they don't, they, somehow they, I you know, get away with it. <laughs> they're like, "Oh, again with the tentacles." Oh, the tentacles. <laughs> I've got to get some tentacles. Ah, there you go. There's there's, there's a trap idea for you. Yeah, you that one for. Um. Yeah. What so? What other what other pieces have you found that you really you know, like? You, you mentioned the trap pieces. What I like what that. other? Uh, I like. This may seem strange. I like really long corridors. Yeah, yeah. I just I don't know if it's just because it, it's quick to put down. <laughs> you know, when I'm building something, it's nice to just put boom, 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 like three long sections. And you're like, wow, you're three feet down the table. You know, already you're like, wow, that that took up a lot of room. Right. And now they're going to have to march down that long corridor. Right, right. And I just, I don't like putting together tiny little rooms, you know, like, of course it's cool, but I love putting down big passageways, like T-shaped passageway, long passageway, four foot passageway. And, and, and I like the, uh, the cavernous passageways. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the thing with passageways is, you know, they're very deadly, mm -hmm. right? Because people, they don't realize until they're actually in passageways. You have like eight eight characters in the passageway. 
and monsters attacking them from the front and the back, <laughs> and the characters in the middle can't do anything. Yeah. And they're like, well, I, I'm going to attack. I say, no, you can't, because look, you're three rows down. You can't get to them. Do you have a pole arm? You can't get there. You know, they're so frustrated. And, and meanwhile, the, the person in the front is getting killed. Right. And uh, I think that's why I love the passageways, especially the narrow passage. Mm -hmm. I like the to get foot, them stuck. Five foot passageways. I like to get them stuck in the narrow passageways and then, and then yeah. they get attacked from one or both sides. <laughs> can't see. Maybe it's dark. Yeah. And, and, it just points out how bad their tactics are. You, know? like, you, you, don't uh, never, you don't have it in your game, a bunch of people that see it, see you lay out a passageway and say, oh, yeah, we're not going there. Well, I cover everything up with cloth. Yeah. They really don't know what, what's ahead. You yeah. know, you, you, you un uncover it a little bit at a time. Now, when they see that they're going in to a narrow passage, they should all panic. Right. And they should get ready for the eventuality. We're, we're going back to the tavern. We're done here. <laughs> They should know this is a very dangerous area, <laughs> and they should prepare for it. Or one of the things that always happens is they're in a room, but they're getting attacked by a monster, and and instead of uh, you know, like for instance, there's a passageway in a room. Instead of all running back into the room where they can now all attack, they immediately they stay in the corridor and fight. And like, dude, that. Why don't you put yourself in a better position where like eight of you can attack at once instead of just two of you? And you'd be like, it's been 35 years we've been playing this game. It seems so simple. No, I usually just have all new players. Oh, really? So I, oh, okay. I come around to conventions. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, so there are always a new table full of players and they always fall for the same. <laughs> so eventually, simple. eventually everyone in the world will will know not to fight in a passageway if you if you keep doing this. Hopefully, hopefully teaching, you're uh, teaching the world not to fight in hallways. Teach them about narrow five players at a very time. bad, deadly thing, yeah. and they should be in fear of that more than anything. It's funny because while you're talking, I'm thinking like, how do I build a narrow passageway with the pieces of Dwarven Forge that I have? And I'm like, if I take wall pieces. And yeah. I put them back to front. I can create like a oh. narrow passageway. That's right. Yeah. You could. I did notice I was uh, narrow passage pieces. Yeah. Well. Right. Right. I noticed that um, I, I was I was poking around on the Dwarven Forge website uh, yesterday, I think, and I saw that you now have Dwarvenite hallway pieces. Yeah. That I don't think were on the Kickstarter originally. I don't. I don't. If they were there, I don't remember them. We did have them on the new. The Dungeon of Doom or, or ones that are you know, there? Yeah. They, these look like they were from the original, you know, they, they look like the original Dwarvenite pieces. Oh. You don't have columns and whatnot. Um, yeah. But they but they were like, you know, hallway pieces. And I was like, oh, look at those. The we do have some modular 10-foot wide hallways. Yeah, I think, I think those are wider than the 5-foot. Yeah. And they have very strange shapes. They're like... Because you can put them together to make a T-shape or four-way. They, they have very peculiar shapes. It takes a little bit of thinking. you got to get used to how to use them. But then you can make all kinds of passageways. Mm -hmm. we, I think we do have those available. Yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw those. I'm going to have to add that to my shopping cart. And I'm sure there'll be some other things I'll look like. And I'll go, oh, I'll add that too. And then If you want to kill your characters, you need some passageways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Then you need some stuff like, you know, some ochre jelly or some green slime, <laughs> things like that, to slip it on the passages. The invisible gelatinous cubes. Things to drop on them, you know. Right, All right. Um, what accessories have, have you either used or you seen used outside of outside of the 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 um, uh, the products that that you actually sell that have worked particularly well with Dwarven Forge. What are what are some things you've seen people use that that? Uh, you, you mean terrain or? Well, so terrain? like you know, I'm, I'm like lighting effects or fake spider webs from the Halloween store or you know other things that people have kind of added to Dwarven Forge to make it to make a setup even cooler. I see a lot of people on online on the forums and on Facebook. They post pictures of special lighting effects. Mm -hmm. Or one of the great things I think is they're the the modders. They call themselves the modders, and they will take pieces and then they'll they'll cut them up, or they'll dig out spaces. They'll add LEDs. They'll change 
they'll change my pieces and, and make them better. Mm -hmm. They'll change them. They'll add stuff to them. And they're called modders. And they, they have, like, you know, even their own, like, fan website where they post pictures of all the different things they've done. Spliced mm -hmm. and diced them. And they do some really cool stuff. Um, and there, of course, you know, there's lots of companies out there, competing companies that have houses and castles. And, and sometimes I see them combined to make a city and I'll, I'll see other people's stuff and uh, they go good together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it becomes more interesting. And uh, what's great is that, you know, if everyone just keeps everything in the same scale, right. you know, they can mix and match stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so. I, th I think during the Dungeon of Doom Kickstarter, uh, in some of the videos, you were using like smoke machines and stuff like that to make it look. Oh yeah, kind of cool. That, have you ever, have you used that during your actual games? Uh, we ran a game at Gen Con where we actually utilized a smoke machine. I think mm -hmm. from this company, FX Special Effects something, mm -hmm. Dungeon Effects. Was that Dungeon? Oh, uh, no, I did uh, uh, the smoke machine at Gen Con. I wasn't a Oh, he missed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they had a Kickstarter and they sold all these fog machines. That So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, we built a castle in the town and uh, the smoke was going all over. Yeah. Cool. Didn't, didn't distract, didn't, didn't kick in anyone's asthma or anything like that? No, it was water-based smoke, you know, water-based. And the only thing, after a couple of hours, you get a little bit of condensation. So you got to wipe the pieces with some paper towels, but mm -hmm. they hold up fine. <laughs> right. But it was actually very useful in this adventure because they had to find a trap door on the ground. And the actual, the, the fog was covering it up. Mm -hmm. So they didn't <laughs> see it at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is that, that, that's actually yeah. There's sort of a a, a meta game, a meta game that goes on with this. That like, I've had I've had players who will not hide their. They'll have like a rogue, but yeah. they won't they won't hide the rogue from one of the monsters. They will hide the rogue from me by hiding like behind a pillar in Dwarven Forge, right? So oh, wow. I can't. I forget about them. I forget <laughs> that they have a rogue there. They're and actually hiding them behind a pillar. Yeah, so it's, it's wow. the same with like the smoke machine. You know, if, if the DM can't see it, you know that's what really matters. It's not a not a question whether the monsters can see it or not. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You must be very difficult for the, they're resorting to all these sorts of. No, things. it's the exact opposite. <laughs> they're they, difficult. They walk, they walk all over me. They're difficult. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you so so? This is another another like common joke that I see on on Twitter, particularly with really elaborate setups is that you know somebody will somebody will set up a really elaborate setup and then the, and then the big joke is yeah and then that's that's the time when they took a left turn and went someplace completely different right yeah we, we don't feel like going to the castle yeah we're not, we don't want to go there yeah <laughs> yeah I, I think i yeah I, I had built my right after i got the castles yeah. kickstarter built this huge tower with the lights and everything like that and they're all like yeah we're not going there and i said look Whatever direction you head, you're only going to a castle. Right? That's like, right. <laughs> these are all around you. You're surrounded by That's these right. things. You're you got to kind of corral them. <laughs> in, you know? um, How do you, you handle that in your games? I find that, you know, deduction of experience points works. <laughs> you know, uh, level drain. Right. Like that, you know. Right. It's usually, you know, I mean, come on, you know, when they come to play with me, you know, they, they're, they're expecting a <laughs> they, they don't, they don't walk into your game and go, ah, we don't want to go to that stupid uh, dungeon. Yeah. We want to go, yeah, That's we're going to for, you know, so right. usually what happens is it's the reverse. I'm there doing some role playing in the city and maybe they're probably thinking, man, when is he going to get us into the dungeon? You know? <laughs> Yep. Yep. I wish you would stop role playing. What is this theater of the mind stuff? Let's right. get into that dungeon. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> I like to do both when I play. You know. Sure. A little bit of um, both. So it's what? D and D. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's the. Even though you have all the terrain and everything, you know, you still want to have characters and act it out and have fun. You know. Right. Right. It's not a board game. You know? Right. So th this gets to something. I and then you know. I mean, sometimes I have to be slapped in the head with the obvious before I really get something. Um, but throughout, you know, I, I, I played, so I played a little bit of third edition with Dwarven Forge and a lot of fourth edition with Dwarven Forge. And now I'm, now I'm, you know, playing fifth and 
I really only used it for big combat set pieces, right? Like I'd build out big arena, like big battle arenas, you know, and every every object in there was like something that would occur that would have an effect in combat. And what I realized watching you guys talk about and um, play with the uh, Dungeons of Doom stuff was like, you know, scenes of, of, of interaction and exploration are just as rich with Dwarven Forge as combat scenes are. You know, it doesn't have to be filled with monsters all the time. No. No, I mean, everyone's different, right? I mean, you can... Um... Some other people might build some crazy cerebral room with all kinds of puzzles and uh, role-playing opportunities, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one thing comes to mind is, like, you know, having jail cells and, like, finding some prisoners in there or stuff like that, you know? Um, you know, we go back to my uh, characters in the middle of this lake, you know? They're all right. trying to figure out what the hell to do, how do we get out of there? <laughs> and, and they can hear the guy rowing, you know, right. the buses rowing. And uh, I had this guy doing sound effects, and he's he's making the sound of the of the rowing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh my god, the the giant's coming back! <laughs> you know, and to see the look of panic on their faces, you know, we, we got to do something. You know, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I I use, you know, I I dress up and I got. Uh, I turned the lights down, mm -hmm. and I've got ambiance music, special effects music, and mm -hmm. yeah, I try to really get into it in uh, every aspect I can. You know, when it's a full-on theatrical D and D, you know, mm -hmm. then I try to you know do everything I can to mm -hmm. make them feel like they're there. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and, uh, different from a more you know standard just let's play D and D in the bright light and with sure. no miniatures, no nothing. It's all just that's easy to play that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I do it sometimes, you know, I do it. I when I you know I could just open a book and play. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's nice to have the full regalia, you know, and just say, wow, now you're gonna be immersed. Right. Uh, definitely it, it's better. Smoke machine, put on the smoke machine, smoke the whole place up. You know, <laughs> maybe smoke a little something. I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Have a drink or two. You know, have everyone immerse themselves into the thing. You know? Right, right, right. Um, have you found like so? So in you know, you mentioned you mentioned your love of traps, and you yeah. know, the traps really fit that idea of exploring a place. Like like you know, they go through a corridor and they have to check out the walls and, and check for traps. Uh, check for love traps. Love the holding too. Yeah. Have you ever built? Have you ever built layouts? And I'm, I'm thinking about like you know Zaltair's you know Zaltair's you know throne room, the first the first encounter room that you have in in uh, Zaltar. Yeah, I had Zaltar him. In the, throne, the first encounter in, in Dungeon of Doom. Time he shows up. It's usually bad. Yeah, right. And I was thinking like that could be a really interesting role play scene. Like you know they they walk in and have a conversation in there. It doesn't have to be a big you know a lot of fireballs getting thrown around. Oh yeah, you know, it could be just a hard a hard conversation. For me, strangely enough, most of all the role playing conversations are happening in the town. Yeah, because there's you know there's people around, right? Mm -hmm. You're meeting all kinds of people, so there's a lot of uh, stuff going on there, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I'm really happy that people are are buying the towns and the castles because I always thought that like you know this is a very rich area for people to have adventures and fun, mm -hmm. and I think. People are catching on that, you know, it's not just go out of the town and to some far off dungeon somewhere, but you mm -hmm. can have an entertaining time just in the town the mm -hmm. entire time. Right, you know? right. And uh, so we're seeing more of that. Mm -hmm. And one thing I found, which is good, it's great if you have, you know, one off games or let's say you have a group of people and, you know, you have a weekly game. Not everyone can show up every week. Mm -hmm. You know, now if you're all in the town, that's easy. Mm -hmm. You know, all right. You know, Dave went back home and uh, Susie showed up instead. You know, like mm -hmm. it's easy. You never make any big excuses. You know, and what what we have in in my world of Mithras Valoria, there's dungeons below the city. Right. There's sewers and dungeons and caves, and they're all right below the city. So what's great is that uh, you know when you leave the dungeon, you're right back in town mm -hmm. 
And we even have instances where they come back up, they cure some people, and then they go back down into the dungeon. <laughs> It's a little bit like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> and they go and take a quick rest. Yeah, back at right. their house. <laughs> <laughs> Which is right. Yeah, we got them. They go back home and sleep in a nice bed. <laughs> Every night. Home, so they go right back right. into the dungeon. Right back down to whatever room yeah. they just left at. It's kind of... I think, yeah, I was, I was, I was another fellow that was on the show previously. Uh, um, um, David Hartledge is his name, DM David. And he was talking about how dungeons each each level like players got to decide how hard the dungeon was going to be by how many levels deep they went into it yes. right and you can be like well let's go to seventh level you know let's, yeah. let's have a hard time we'll go way down there where the demons are hanging out yes I, the I like in, uh, yeah every nice world. every nice house has a little trap door that can take you right down to whatever level the dungeon you want to go to the deeper you go the worse it gets for sure right yeah, yeah. That's neat. That's, uh, so, uh, getting back to another question, you were talking about the modders and and the and the mods that they have done. Does it does it does it break your heart to watch them taking a drill to, you know, these pieces no, that you put I, together? I love it. Yeah, I love to see what they do. And here's the thing with with the dwarvenite is even though you can like run over it with a truck, right. uh, uh, you can slice into it very easily. Right. Right. So uh, while it'll survive falls and and crashes and stuff. It's very vulnerable to slicing damage. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> that's its Achilles heel. You could just take an exacto knife and just, <laughs> just cut it. Oh God! Oh, it, you know? oh you're, you're so, killing me! I didn't know that, and I didn't. I wish I never knew. It's like rubber. It's kind of like you know, <laughs> yeah, sure. like just a slice into it, yeah. so they can carve out things and then you know put lights in, and mm -hmm. so it's it's good for that. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Now now with the resin that we used to have, it would have been more messy. Then you need to get like you can't carve into that. Yeah, you and you can't like you can't a even, Right. You, know, it goes, zzz, you gotta zzz. put a mask on, right? You can't that's nail that really stuff. messy. Yeah, that's a lot harder to mod. So right. all the modders really love dwarvenite. It's much better for them. No sure. mess. You know. Yeah, dwarvenite's dwarvenite's great stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Um, so for people on the road and and for people who play games outside of their house, uh, are there good techniques that you have for like both how to you know how to pick the right sets to to transport, and then how to sort of build them and tear them. You know, build them up and tear them down quickly. Uh, well, this is something that we addressed in our latest Kickstarter. You know, I don't I want to sound like a commercial. No, that's all right, man. <laughs> but that's exactly why we have these terrain trays. Right. You know, because you can now, if you imagine, um, the Dungeon of Doom. We actually built that whole dungeon on terrain trays. So if you had been a DM, you could have taken every room off of our table on its terrain tray. Mm -hmm. With the magnets, you could like, let's say, just put, put one, put it in a box, put another tray on top of that, another tray up on top of that, and you would have had all your different rooms stacked mm -hmm. on a big box. And then you just drive to the convention and, and everything would be on magnets That's so it would shuffle around. You literally could pre-build your dungeon, bring it to convention, on these trays and then just lay it out as they advance. And those are, are those, those are 12 by 12s? They're a bunch of different shapes. You got with a 12 by 12, four by four by eight. Yeah. Just those two. Yeah. Four by eights and 12 by 12. 12 by 12. Four by eights are good for passageways, things like that. Those, those five foot passages you were talking about. Yeah, and obviously you can you can put two next to each other, right? <laughs> can split the party up across two different five foot passages. Yeah, then, yeah, they're really, yeah. then they're really hosed. <laughs> you know, the light source only illuminates a certain area. You can't put, <laughs> right. put one one section at a time. Right, know? right. Uh, um, that yeah, that's that's I'm I'm looking for it. I picked up a couple of the, the the terrain trays, and I hadn't really thought about the idea that yeah, that means I can build a room ahead of time. Yeah, and then you just bring it out. Take, take it right to the shop and, and drop you, it. You the keep table. it. You keep it behind your screen, or you know, in the next room, or behind the the curtain, or something, and you just go and you grab the next one. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. I usually just pre-build the whole thing on the table, covered with cloth. Right. Little pieces. I take T-shirts and cut them off. Yeah. Cut them yep. up and just lift it off. But you could also use yeah. a terrain tray and just bring it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's neat. Yeah, I, I do the same. I have a bunch of old old black t shirts that I cut up and, and I use as my fog of war. There you go. And then if you have a small table, 
then that's better to bring out bit by bit because you only need to have like maybe one or two rooms at a time. Right. When right. they continue, you just you know take one off and bring in another tray, and you know you can kind of scroll it along. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Great. So different methods. So we we have one one other participant here, our guardian angel Alex Basso. Alex, are you there? Yes. Hello. I'm here. Do you want to do you want to give us some questions from the audience? Yes, let's oh, get started with them. Thanks for everyone who's asked questions. You thought it was just you and I this whole time, didn't you? <laughs> oh my god, we're live! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first I have one from Grant R. Ellis in Twitch chat. He wants to know, what artists inspired you or influenced your style? Oh, wow. Uh, my style, like, is in uh, dungeon making or painting? or We'll go with dungeon making. Dungeon making. Uh, I mean, Donald A. Terrier, that you mm -hmm. know, was my favorite artist from the from the first edition books. Uh, also, Frank Frazetta mm -hmm. was a big influence. I loved Frank Frazetta, and and especially reading the uh, the book. The book really only wrote one long book and a bunch of little scattered stories. But man, what a what a book it was! I think it was called. The Hour of the Dragon, hmm. and then later they they renamed it like Conan the Conqueror. Robert mm -hmm. E. Howard, man, that book is just it's Dungeons and Dragons, you know, <laughs> like every bit of it, you know. And so when I build dungeons and stuff, I'm imagining that Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, you know, imagining those kinds of things. Um, other than that, I mean, when I started making these dungeons, uh, there really wasn't anything else. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anyone making really dungeons. Mm -hmm. There was a few things I saw here and there, but uh, nothing on the scope. I think there was a, a company that did something, the dungeon work, and uh, there were like little things on, on, on uh, magnetic walls. Mm -hmm. And I think TSR had done some kind of orc caves or something, perhaps. But no, mostly everyone was just using uh, pen and paper. Mm -hmm. until I burst on the scene 96 with the full-out dungeon, Lego-like dungeon pieces. Yeah, right, right. That was so... My, I was inspired by miniatures. There mm -hmm. wasn't really people making sculpted dungeons, but there were people making uh, really great miniatures. Right. Tom Meyer comes to mind. He did some incredibly beautiful little miniatures. Tom Meyer, Sandra Garrity... Uh, did beautiful miniatures. And so Sandra Garrett is one of the first sculptors I hired <laughs> to ah. do some of my stuff. Uh -huh. I was always, I, I'm still honored that to someone that I was, you know, uh, admiring was now then working with me and doing sculpting pieces. So That's great. I still pinch myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Living the life. <laughs> I am. I am living the life. I, really. I was in New York reading uh, these books. Gary Gygax, who is this genius? Gary Gygax, wow. Never imagined that one day I would meet him. Yeah, right. And be friends of his family and, and go out, you know, raise a beer with Luke Gygax and Ernie mm -hmm. and Alex and all these guys. I mean, I would be nuts. Not never would imagine it. So I am living a kind of a, a dream, you know? <laughs> That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. And we all we're all benefiting from it. Well, you know, we got a great community. The gaming community is just great. I think it's uh, one of uh, mankind's uh, last hopes to retain our humanity. You know, in this digital age where we're all—I don't know if any of you guys have seen Blade Runner yet. Yep, loved it. Yeah, I walked out of it about you know an hour in. I, I it was I was shaken to my core, like oh my. God. God, this is too real. This is exactly what's going to happen to all of us. I can't take it. I actually walked out. I'm going to go back and see it, but I, I had to steal myself to come back and make a saving throw and go watch it. And I loved it. I loved what I saw, but it was just like, wow, just uh, this dystopian future that yeah. we're that's coming upon us fast. Yeah, right. Yeah. right, it was a little different in Blade Runner. Oh my god! Like, yeah, yeah, it's far off. Like, yeah. oh, no, Blade no, Runner was cool, but this one was really close. closer yeah. to home. Like, I was like, it looks wow. like next Tuesday. Yeah. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> it was really. It's it's a scary, scary yeah. 
look into the future. And I think it's happening to us. Yep. You know, it's just like 1984, you know, George Orwell, all this stuff. We're, we're living this now, and it's just freaking me out a little. <laughs> and, uh, well, we yeah, can get on this topic. We don't play this, yeah. Oh, it, it's just, wow. So, Alex, what other questions you got? All right, next, we have one from Short Man Ian. He wants to know, what was the most difficult piece of terrain that you've designed or created? Good question. That is a good question. Probably never came out. <laughs> <laughs> it's still on the table. <laughs> still working on it. Uh, wow. Uh, the most difficult. The caverns were very hard. Yeah. Caverns. And especially when I first started doing Dwarvenite. You can't have any undercuts in Dwarvenite. It's steel molds, and you can't have it. So making something as, you know, crazy as a cavern, you have to make sure that when you're sculpting it that you don't have undercuts, and you have to understand how can this be pulled off in, in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. And so I was really freaked out, and we had a lot of troubles in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Dwarvenite caverns? Dwarvenite caverns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the second time around. So mm -hmm. the first, first caverns weren't that hard because you have rubber molds. Mm -hmm. For resin, it's rubber, and they give way. So you don't have to be as careful. But with steel mold, you know, you got to be real careful. So okay. that was freaking me out a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to understand a lot about the angles that I never really had to think. Figure sculptors doing the little miniatures, they, they think about that all the time. How are you going to pull this out of the mold, you know, kind of thing? Huh. So that that really twisted my mind up. Did it did and it twist I, your mind before or after the Kickstarter? Before when I was sculpting, so you were you were already yeah you already had everything kind of made by then right at least the you didn't have all the pieces obviously but you had the molds by then. Before the launch of the Kickstarter, I have to go and make the stuff. Right. We try to have at least you know ninety percent of the stuff sculpted before we launch because we have to show people what they're pledging for. Sure. You know, like you can't just go out there and say, "Hey, we're gonna make great stuff." Dad, Back us. us. We're gonna make something cool. <laughs> I think you probably could. <laughs> you have a there's a cult Dwarven Forge cult following that would probably just if you had a blank Kickstarter page, you'd probably do okay. Well, you might you might fly with one or two pieces, but not not like you know the scope of <laughs> the, the, the mystery people, people grab trust us. Yeah. But not that much. Not that much. Not that much. The mystery grab bag Dwarven Forge set. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to get, but it's going to be great. Yeah. You know, in fact, I did do something like that. When I came out with the trap set, I was thinking to myself, man, I can't tell them what's in here. Like, <laughs> everyone will know. Like, all the players. So traps. Yeah. So I actually <laughs> did not provide a picture. Or I just said, "Hey, trust me, these traps are going to—you're going to love them, and or you're going to hate them." <laughs> uh, and uh, actually, that set did not do so well. <laughs> People want to see. They the didn't traps. trust me. They didn't trust me yeah. enough. They uh, and and so we didn't sell a ton of them. We did okay. We didn't do great. Like I'm, I'm convinced if I had shown pictures of all these crazy traps, we would have sold like way better. Right. But, you know, so now only the people that had the faith, they got the trap set. And they were like, oh, wow. <laughs> right, they they got to, to utilize it all. And then the other people never got it. So that's that's actually a pretty good point that I don't I don't know that I'd ever considered, which are players who go to the Dwarven Forge website just to see the traps so they know what they have to face at a game. That's like yeah. a whole new level of metagaming. Metagame, right? Yeah, that's that's you yes. Know, reading them, it's, that's that's like one step beyond reading the monster manual. Well, I mean, what I would say is that there's so many things now yeah. that you just don't know what's yeah, going to be on the next right, corner. Right. I mean, is it, it, it going like, to be the block that comes and crushes me from right. above? Or is there, it the know, beheading the, the beheading wall trap? You don't know which one. <laughs> you don't know which one, and you don't know when. You know right. they're coming at you all sides. Right. You know? yeah. That's great. Alex, what else you got? Is he there? I have a question here from Sayer. Uh, he wants to know, do you have any adv any advice on how to run a wildly successful Kickstarter, and were you surprised by the success of them? Uh, well, no, I, I, I'm an optimistic guy. I, I thought that we were going to do really good. I, I actually thought we would do better. 
you know, my, we did the first Kickstarter. I thought we'd do better. Um, I was, I guess I was happy in the end, but I really thought we should have reached more people. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was maybe the first one. Maybe that's why we didn't get as many mm-hmm. people, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I'm very happy now. It did, it did good. It's all about the backer numbers, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, what I think we did, that was our best one in terms of backers. We did like four or 5,000, mm-hmm. I think, right? And uh, then our least good one was like, uh, I think it was Castle. Castle? 1,700 or something for the castles, mm-hmm. which was a lot low. Right then, uh, Dungeon of Doom, we did more, right? We did yeah. 2,700. I think it was 2,700. We're getting back. We're getting better again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, when I think about all the Dungeons and Dragons people out there, I think it must be like 10 million or more. Mm. You know, I, 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 I realize that we're a very, very niche, very small group. Mm-hmm. You know? And I understand it's because it, it costs money. Mm-hmm. You know? It costs money. But, uh, I want all of them. I want to get all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I imagine it's going up. I mean, fifth fifth edition. Yeah, you know, just from from numbers that I've seen kicking around, fifth edition is definitely bringing more people into the the RPG circle yeah. overall. And I imagine that that you know. And uh, people like it. I've heard good things about fifth edition. Uh, I still play I've heard first good things. edition. Never played fifth edition. <laughs> I tried to play, but. Uh, I like first edition. Not first, Fifth yeah. edition is similar to first, but sure. it's like on on steroids a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, people have more hit points. Mm-hmm. They've got more things they can do. Yep. It's uh, easier for them to find those traps too. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, that. I like the danger of first edition. Right. Where your magic user might have like two hit points. Right. It's like, yeah. oh my Our, god. They're, they're talking about about yeah. you know? magic missile, and then you gotta take out your darts. <laughs> where it's where oh, you darts. die a lot. You die, and you roll up a new character and you die. And you roll up a new <laughs> character and you die. And then you see if you ever make it to second level, you're like, ah, I'm second level. I'm a badass. That's the good old days, you know? God forbid you make it to fourth or fifth level, you're like, I'm a real badass. Now you all you gotta do is blink in your fifth level. You know, uh, I don't think that that the the younger generation appreciates as much how hard it is to get the second level. They need to go through those five foot wide halls, man. Used to be scared of orcs. Right. Scared of orcs. My God, is an orc coming with you an axe? I've got two hit points. I don't know. I, I scared a uh, I scared a thirteenth level fifth edition group with a, a single hobgoblin. So it yeah. can be done. That's the way it should be. <laughs> uh, I'm old school, you know. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. Whatever floats your boat. If they like fifth, fourth, third, whatever. As long as they're playing D&D right. or any kind of RPG. Sure. You know, get people around the table and play and not not become androids. Mm-hmm. You know, let's not get to Blade Runner. Let's not be like <laughs> virtual reality, everything, and like right. everything, nothing is real anymore. Right. Oh, uh, let's retain our humanity. It's a very important period in, in uh, humankind right now. Very important. We may lose our humanity right now. Mm-hmm. We'll all become cyborgs, and uh, no one will, you know, we won't have even boyfriends and girlfriends anymore. <laughs> AI. It's better. Yeah. Like, wow. My virtual reality girlfriend never denies me anything. Not, right. you know, she uh, always pays it. Yeah, she always listens to me. She doesn't nag me or anything. <laughs> you know, I, I'm tired of my real girlfriend. You know, I'm not go, even going to go out anymore. You know, what if that happens to everybody? Yep. You know, we already have like this crazy war, Warcrafts, you know, and everyone's like, they play <laughs> this virtual, they have this virtual reality life, and they end up sitting at home doing nothing. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but, you know, this is a little party. <laughs> They could be sitting at home playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> yes, but, but with real people. With real people. With yeah. real people sitting yeah. around, raising a glass of beer together and laughing and talking and socializing like, like you used to do around a campfire. Right. Retain our humanity. So that's what we're trying to do. Save mankind. 
So, so Dwarven Forge is not moving into the VR, the world of uh, VR. I don't think so. <laughs> You're building physical things. Yes. <laughs> I never, other, seen never, but you I just know. I was gonna say I just saw like a little glint in your eye, like, huh? Well, I, I, I just thought to myself, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Hang on, that, that's not <laughs> Don't say something you thought it was We live right. in a day and age, you know, where we're like, take yours and I was gonna be like, hey, remember all, this interview? Right, you're all remember about retaining interview? humanity. Like, wait a minute, virtual You virtual. said you would never go there. <laughs> you liar. Never, yep. You know. Alex, what else you got for us? We got a question here from Ludatis. Uh, he wants to know, what should I do if my DM doesn't spend enough time building with his Dwarven Forge? So, for the record, this is one of the guys at my table. This is ludicrous? <laughs> yeah, what? he is kind of ludicrous. That's wow. for sure. Yeah, yeah. He's that actor, isn't he? How do you convince your lazy dungeon master to spend more time building a good Dwarven Forge setup? Wow. I, I would say buy him some Dwarven Forge. There you go. You hear that? <laughs> Dishes or whatever. There's Christmas, right? Buy more There's Dwarven birthdays. Forge There's... for your DM. If all the players pool together. And Thank you, you. If everyone just buys one set, let's say you have six players, you got a whole layout right there. Maybe we could even say that they should reimburse their DM for the cost uh, that they spent on the Dungeons of Doom Kickstarter. Would you think that's a good idea? You know, I'd say maybe every time they go to play, you know, you have a little DM tip jar. <laughs> Throw some money in there. Show some love, you know. I love All the work place. goes on the DM, man. I mean, really, it's a lifetime of work, and uh, you should reward your DM. Yep, yep, Slip that's... in a 20, you know, maybe a 100 here and there. There you go. There yeah. you go. I, I guarantee you that wasn't the answer he was hoping for, but I'm trying to take it. <laughs> so, yeah. You know... Alex, what else you got for us? Another question here from Shortman Ian. He wants to know what are some of the set pieces you created for Storm King's Thunder campaign of Dwarven Forge, or I guess any other major set pieces you guys created and enjoyed. Uh, is he asking Stefan or is he asking me? Uh, I think this is for both. Okay, Stefan, have you have you played? Well, 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 I'll expand the question. Has there been a particular module, uh, like an adventure, that you've built a Dwarven Forge? Uh, set up around one that one that's memorable to you. I, I've strangely enough, I've never really used modules. Really, never. I, I, you know, I grew up like in New York City, and I wasn't around any other gamers really. I just I bought those first books, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and in there, Gary Gygax, Gary Gygax laid out the thing. He said, "Hey, you got to make your own world. You got to design your world. You got to make your dungeon." So I set to doing that, right? You know, from the time I was 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I never looked back. And I and mm -hmm. I regret it now in a way because people wax and wane about, "Oh, remember that module?" And I'm like, right. "Man, I never played that." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? It's so never I too late. Missed out. <laughs> I missed out on that kind of they're thing. They're all they're all still there. There, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I, 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 I got to play in a module at Gen Con with Luke Gygax. Yeah. Luke Gygax, and it was, I think it was against the Hill Giants or the yeah, study sure. of the Hill Giant Chief or something. And I played in that module, and Luke was sitting right next to me, and he was playing. Um, oh, what was that character he was playing? Melf. That's oh, his yeah, character. Sure. He was playing Melf. Yeah. And he yeah. had me through the little minute meteors. Yeah. And the, and the acid arrows. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, I can't believe I'm sitting here yeah. next to Luke playing in this module. Actual, and he's actual throwing Melf. the meteors. You know, I was like, wow. So that was yeah. another pinch me moment, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Alex, you got, any, you got one last question for us tonight? I've pretty much gone through all of them at this point. You've covered them all. Yeah. All right. More Very questions. Good. No more questions. We've we've answered it all. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, I want to thank you. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. I love your work. I've been a fan for, for a decade. I, I used it two days ago and can't wait to get my, my Dungeons of Doom thank in, you. in hand. Uh, it's It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to and, to plug? Any any. Anything you want to pitch or, or anywhere that people can find you to, uh, to dig into your world a little more? 
Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to announce that uh, soon, in the next several months, my campaign world of Mithras shall be unleashed in full. We already have the short version, a short you know, taste of it up on our website. You can download a PDF. It's like 63 pages. But we're going to launch into the campaign book and the player's book. They'll both be different. Maps, of course, lots and lots of maps, illustrations, and the whole broad-ranging Mithras and City of Aloria. And uh, I'm very excited because obviously I've been working on that for 30 years, and uh, it's going to come out soon. Great. It's great. very simple world. It's hack and slash, kind of like wilderness, post-apocalyptic. Go out, build your castle, clear the lands, find the treasure. Very easy to understand, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, and and, like, and and I think it's part of I I, I assume that the um, uh, the Dungeons of Doom adventure that you guys put together is part of the Kickstarter. Uh, that's in Mithras as well. Uh, you know, Nate made that up. Nate. Oh, did he? Okay, he's yeah. the guy. He's got a mohawk, and he's yeah, a very yeah, very yeah. great Nate. guy. And, and yeah. Toby was also helping you. You guys were figuring this out. Yeah, yeah. They, they figured got, it uh, out. You have yeah. a Teos, Teos Abadia is, is writing at least some or some of it for you, I believe. Is that right? Ooh. Teos Abadia? Teos Abadia. Oh, okay, yeah. You see? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's been on this very show himself. <laughs> oh, yes. So they were working with people. They were building that thing up while I was doing something else, yeah. you know. Making world sculpting. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> they were building that whole thing up, and right, uh, that has nothing to do with. Uh, <laughs> but who know? I mean, you can put it into any any world. You know, why not? Uh, there are some things in it that are part of Mythos, like the burrows. The burrows we imagine together. This is in a, in a particular area of Mythos. There's the burrows and. Of course, uh, lots of things that we create to imagine mm -hmm. it's in parts, but it could be part of anybody's world. Yeah, you know, it's sure. be Mithras, it'd be yours, yours, anyone. Right. Those right. Basic dungeon things, right? right. Chasms, LEDs, yeah. you know, okay, <laughs> everything in there is standard basic stuff. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. I wish you luck with all your future endeavors. I'll certainly be certainly right. be on board. So, so. Right on. We're getting ready for Kickstarter 6 now. Oh, no. Yes. Now it's here. You're doing another one. That's shocking. We're, we're working on it right <laughs> now. We're just going to get started. I okay. think there's going to be, you know, should we spill some beans here? Spill a bean. Give us a bean. Huh? Yeah, we need to start the work. He says no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, worth a shot. Uh, man, yeah, there may be some. I can't say anything, no. Oh, you can say it. We won't tell anybody. We may revisit the cavern situation. Ah, interesting. Okay, very good. Very good. Well, whatever it is, there will we'll be, be watching. some caverns. Will be some caverns. There'll be caverns in there. We decided there needs more. Excellent. Excellent. So, there will be a little bit of every, but there's caverns will be visited heavily. Great. Well, it's been a great pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on the show. All right. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll talk to you great. soon. All right, thank you everybody for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at 7.30 Pacific with the uh, Venture Maidens stream. Have a good night, everyone.